No one who had ever seen Catherine Morland in her infancy would have supposed her born to be an heroine. Her situation in life, the character of her father and mother, her own person and disposition were all equally against her. Her father was a clergyman, without being neglected or poor, and a very respectable man, though his name was Richard, and he had never been handsome. He had a considerable independence besides two good livings, and he was not in the least addicted to locking up his daughters. Her mother was a woman of useful plain sense, with a good temper, and what is more rem remarkable, with a good constitution. She had three sons before Catherine was born, and instead of dying and bringing the latter into the world, as anybody might expect, she still lived on, lived to have six children more, to see them growing up around her, and to enjoy excellent health herself. A family of ten children will be always called a fine family, where there are heads and arms and legs enough for the number, but the Morwellands had little other right to the word, for they were in general very plain, and Catherine, for many years of her life, as plain as any. She had a thin, awkward figure, a sallow skin without colour, dark, lank hair, and strong features. So much for pers her person, and not least unpositioned, unpropitious for heroism, seemed her mind. She was fond of all boys' plays, and greatly preferred cricket, not merely to dolls, but to the more heroic enjoyments of infancy, nursing a dormouse, feeding a canary bird, or watering a rosebush. Indeed, she had no taste for a garden, and if she gathered flowers at all, it was cheaply for the pleasure of mis mischief, at least so it was conjectured, from her always preferring those that she was forbidden to take. Such were her propensities, her abilities were quite as extraordinary. She never could learn or understand anything before she was taught, and sometimes not even then, she was, for she was often inattentive and occasionally stupid. Her mother was three months in teaching her only to repeat the beggar's petition, and after all her next sister, Sally, could say it better than she did. Not that Catherine was always stupid, by no means. She learned the fable of the hare and many friends as quickly as any girl in England. Her mother wished her to learn music, and Catherine was sure she would like it, for she was fond of tinkling the, knee, the keys of the old forlorn spinet. So at eight years old she began. She learned a year and could not bear it, and Mrs. Morland, who did not insist on her daughter's being accomplished, in spite of incapacity or distaste, allowed her to leave off. The day which dismissed the music master was one of the happiest of Catherine's life. Her taste for drawing was not superior, though whenever she could obtain the outside of a letter from her mother or, see, or seize upon any other old odd piece of paper, she did what she could in that way by drawing houses and trees, hens and chickens, all very much like one another. Writing an account she was taught by her father, French by her mother. Her proficiency in either was not remarkable, and she shirked her lessons in both whenever she could. What a strange and accountable character! For with all these symptoms of profligacy, at ten years old, she had neither a bad heart nor a bad temper, was seldom stub stubborn, scarcely ever quarrelsome, and very kind to the little ones with few interruptions of tyranny. She was, moreover, noisy and wild, hated confinement and cleanliness, and loved nothing so well in the world as rolling down the green slope at the back of the house. Such was Catherine Morland at ten. At fifteen, appearances were mending. She began to curl her hair and long for balls. Her complexion improved. Her features were softened by plumpness and colour. Her eyes gained more animation, and her figure more consequence. Her love of dirt gave way to an inclination for finery, and she grew clean as she grew smart. She had now the pleasure of sometimes hearing her father and mother remark on her personal improvement. Catherine grows quite a good-looking girl, 
She's almost pretty today, with well, once that caught her ears now and then, and how welcome were the sounds. To look almost pretty to an acquisition of higher is an acquisition of higher delight to a girl who's been looking plain the first fifteen years of her life than a beauty from her cradle can ever conceive. Mrs. Morland was a very good woman and wished to see her children everything they ought to be, but her time was so much occupied in lying in and teaching the little ones that her elder daughters were inevitably left to shift for themselves, and it was not very wonderful that Catherine, who had by nature who had by nature nothing heroic about her, should prefer cricket, baseball, riding on a horseback, and running about the country at the age of fourteen to books, or at least books of information. For provided that nothing like useful knowledge could be gained from them, provided they were all story and no reflection, she had never any objection to books at all. But from fifteen to seventeen, she was in training for a heroine. She read, she read all such works as heroines must read to supply their memories with those quotations which are so serviceable and so soothing in the vicissitudes of their eventful life. From Pope she learned to censure those who bear about to the mockery of woe. From the day that many a flower is born to blush unseen and waste its fragrance on the desert air. From Thompson that it is a delightful task to teach the young idea how to shoot. And from Shakespeare she gained a great story store of information, among the rest that trifles light as air are to the general jealous confirmation strong as proofs of holy writ. That the poor beetle which we tread upon in corporal sufferance fills a fang as great as when a giant dies, and that a young woman in love always looks like patience on a monument, smiling at grief. So far her improvement was sufficient, and in many other points she came on exceedingly well, for though she could not write sonnets, she brought herself to read them, and though there seemed no chance of her throwing a whole party into raptures by a prelude in the pianoforte of her own composition, she could listen to other people's performances with very little fatigue. Her greatest deficiency was in the pencil. She had no notion of drawing, not enough even to attempt a sketch of her lover's profile, that she might be ta detached, de detected in the design. There she fell miserably short of the true heroic height. At present she did not know her own poverty, for she had no lover to portray. She had reached the age of seventeen without having seen one amiable youth who could call forth her sensibility, without having inspired one real passion, and without having excited even any admiration but what was very immoderate and very transient. This was strange indeed, but strange things may be generally accounted for if their cause be fairly searched out. There was not one lord in the neighbourhood, no, not even a baronet. There was not one family among their acquaintance who had reared and supported a boy accidentally found at their door. Not young, one young man whose origin was unknown. Her father had no ward, and the squire of the parish no children. But when a young lady is to be a heroine, the perverseness, the perverseness of forty surrounding families cannot prevent her Something up, up must and will happen to throw a hero in her way. Mr. Allen, who owned the chief of the property about Fullerton, the village in Wiltshire where the Morlands lived, was ordered to Bath for the benefit of a gouty constitution. And his lady, a good-humoured woman, fond of Miss Morland, probably aware that if adventures will not before fall a young lady in her own village, she must seek them abroad, invited her to go with them. Mr. and Mrs. Morland were all compliance, and Catherine all happiness. <laughs> that, of course, is um, mocking the 
showing how different Catherine is from the the heroines of most novels, sentimental novels, who are be very beautiful, attractive and talented from a very early age mm. and uh, fall in love at a very early age. <laughs> Generally with them. Um, and uh, hmm. I'll just read a bit of the second chapter. In addition to what had been already said of Catherine, Morland's personal and mental endowments, when about to be launched into all the difficulties and dangers of a six weeks residence in Bath, it may be stated for the reader's more certain information, lest the following pages should otherwise fail of getting, giving any idea of what her character, that her heart was affectionate, her disposition cheerful and open, without conceit or affectation of any kind, and manners just removed from the awkwardness and shyness of a girl, her, personal, her person pleasing, and, when in good looks, pretty, and her mind about as ignorant as un and un un unformed as the female mind at seventeen usually is. When the hour for departure drew near, the maternal anxiety of Mrs. Morland will be naturally supposed to be most severe. A thousand alarming presentiments of evil to her beloved Catherine from this terrific separation must oppress her heart with sadness and drown her in tears for the last day or two of their being together and advice of the most important and applicable nature must, of course, flow from her wise lips in their parting. Cautions against the violence of such noblemen and baronets as delight in forcing young ladies away to some remote farmhouse must at such a moment relieve the fullness of her heart. Who would not think so? But Mrs. Morland knew so little of lords and baronets that she entertained no notion of their general mischievousness, and was wholly unsuspicious of danger to her daughter from their machinations. Her cautions were confined to the following points. I beg you, Catherine, always wrap yourself up very warm about the throat when you come from the rooms at night, and I wish you would try to keep some account of the money you spend. I will give you this little book on purpose. Sally, or rather Sarah, uh, for, what, for what young lady of common gentility will reach the age of sixteen without altering her name as far as she can, and must from, from situation be at this time the intimate friend and confidant of her sister. It is remarkable, however, that she neither insisted on Catherine's writing by every post, nor exact, exacted her promise of transmitting the character of every new acquaintance nor a detail of every interesting conversation that Bath might produce. Everything indeed relative to this important journey was done on the part of the Morlands with a degree of moderation and composure which seemed rather consistent with the common feelings of common life than with the refined susceptibilities, the tender emotions which the first separation of a heroine from her family ought always to excite. Her father, instead of giving her an unlimited order on the banker, or even putting an hundred pounds bank bill into her hands, gave her only ten guineas, and promised her more, more when she wanted it. <laughs> Under these unpromising aus auspices, the parting took place and the journey began. It was performed with suitable quietness and une uneventful safety. Neither robbers nor tempests befriended them, nor one lucky overturn to introduce them to the hero. Nothing more alarming occurred than the fear on Mrs. Allen's side of having once left her clogs behind her at an inn, and that fortunately proved to be groundless. They arrived at Bath. Catherine was all eager delight. Her eyes were here, there, everywhere, as they approached its fine and striking environment, environs and afterwards drove through those streets which conducted them to the hostel, the hotel. She came to be happy, and she felt happy already. They were soon settled in comfortable lodgings in Pulteney Street. 
At Bath she becomes friendly with a slightly older girl than herself, who, uh, from her language, one realises is, uh, is a very vain, prattling person, but to uh, who uh, uh, obviously takes uh, the uh, in the hero the heroine incompletely, and um, and who introduces her to uh, to the more spectacular kinds of novels. <laughs> Catherine visits her one day, or they come together, um, and um, Catherine has been a... They met by appointment, and as Isabella had arrived nearly five minutes before her friend, her first address naturally was, My dearest creature, what can have made you so late? I have been waiting for you at least to this age. Have you indeed? I am very sorry for it. But really, I thought I was in very good time. It is but just one. I hope you have not been here long. Oh, these ten ages at least. I am sure I have been here half of this half hour. But now let us go and sit down at the other end of the room and enjoy ourselves. I have none hundred things to say to you. In the first place, I was so afraid it would rain this morning, just as I wanted to set off. It looks very showery and that would have thrown me into agonies. Do you know I saw the prettiest hat you can imagine in a shop window in Milsom Street just now? Very like yours, only the very, very coquelet ribbons instead of green. I quite longed for it. But, my dearest Catherine, what have you been doing with yourself all this morning? morning? Have you gone on with you, Dolfo? Yes, I've been reading it ever since I awoke, and I have got to the black veil. How do you indeed? How delightful! I would not tell you what is behind the black veil for the world. Are you not wild to know? Oh, yes, quite. What can it be? But do not tell me. I would not be told upon any account. I know it must be a skeleton. I am sure it is Laurentina's skeleton. Oh, I am delighted with the book. I should like to spend my whole life in reading it. I assure you, if I had not been to meet, if I it had not been to meet you. I would not have come away from it for all the world. But dear creature, how much I am obliged to you. And when you have finished, Rudolfo, we will read the Italian together. And I have made out a list of ten or twelve more of the same kind for you. Have you indeed? How glad I am. What are they all? I will read you their names directly. Here they are in my pocket book. Castle of Wolfenbach. Clermont. Mysterious Warnings. Necromancer of the Black Forest, Midnight Bell, Orphan of the Rhine, and Horrid Mysteries. These will last us some time. <laughs> yes, pretty well. But are they all horrid? Are you sure they are all horrid? <laughs> oh, yes, quite sure. For a particular friend of mine, a Miss Andrews, a sweet girl, one of the sweetest creatures in the world, has have read every one of them. I wish you knew Miss Andrews. You would be del delighted with her. She is netting herself the sweetest cloak you can conceive. I think her as beautiful as an angel, I'm, and I am so mixed, vexed with the men for not admiring her. I scold them all amazingly about it. I scold them. Do you scold them for not admiring her? Yes, that I do. There is nothing I would not do for those who are really my friends. I have no notion of loving my people by halves. It is not my nature. My attachments are always excessively strong. I told Captain Hunt at one of our assemblies this winter that if he was to tease me all night, I would not dance with him unless he would allow Miss Andrews to be as beautiful as an angel. The men, the men think us incapable of real friendship, you know, and I'm determined to show them the difference. Now, if I were to hear anybody speak slighting of you, slightingly of you, I would fire up in a moment, but that is not at all likely, for you are just the kind of girl to be a great favourite with the men. Oh dear, cried Catherine, colouringly, colouring, 
How can you say so? Oh, I know you very well. You have so much animation, which is exactly what Miss Andrews wants. For I must confess, there is something amazingly insipid about her. <laughs> oh, I must tell you that just after we parted yesterday, I saw a young man looking at you so earnestly. I am sure he is in love with you. Catherine coloured and disclaimed again. Isabella laughed. It is very true upon my honour, but I see how it is. Your indifference to everybody's admiration, except that of one gentleman who shall be nameless. Nay, I cannot blame you. Your feelings are easily understood. Where the heart is really attached, I know very well how little one can be pleased with the attention of anybody else. Everything is so insipid, so uninteresting, that does not relate to the beloved object. I can perfectly comprehend your feelings. But you should not persuade me that I think so very much about Mr. Tilney, for perhaps I may never see him again. Not see him again? My dearest creature, do not talk of it. I'm sure you would be miserable if you thought so. No, indeed I should not. I do not pretend to say that I have not very much, I was not very much pleased with them, but while I have read Udolfo to read, I feel as if nobody would make me miserable. Oh, that dreadful black veil! My dear Isabella, I'm sure there must be a Laurentina skeleton behind it. It is so odd to me that you have never read Udolfo before, but I suppose Mrs. Modern objects to novels. No, she does not. She has very often read Sir Charles Grandison herself, but new books do not fall in our way. Sir Charles Grandison? That is an amazingly horrid book, is it not? I remember Miss Andrews could not get through the first volume. That's a novel by Richardson. Mm. Who then? Mm. It is not like Udolfo at all, and yet I think it is very interesting. Do you indeed? You surprise me. I thought it had not been readable. But, my dearest Catherine, have you settled what to wear on your head tonight? I'm determined at all events to be dressed exactly like you. The men take notice of that, of that sometimes, you know. <laughs> but it does not signify if they do, said Catherine, very ignorantly. Signify? Oh, heavens! I make it a rule never to mind what they say. You are very often amazingly impertinent if you do not treat them with spirit and make them keep their distance. Are they? Well, I never observe that. They always behave very well to me. Oh, they give them till such years. They are like the most conceited creatures in the world and think that themselves are so much important. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs>